go. Okay. All right. Take it away, Dave. Okay. <clears throat> well, welcome everybody. My name is David Miles. I'm a curator at the Cheryl Avery Historical Society's Museum at our home, the Harsha House. Thank you for being here this evening for the second of our virtual, of our four virtual programs, exploring the history of our amazing town. Let's hope it won't be long before many of us can get back together for a good schmooze. Until then, let's get started with my perennial attempt at humor. We need sound effects here, so feel free to growl like Leo, but I digress. The history of Charlevoix is the history of the town's hotels. Just 15 years after our first permanent settlers put down roots in 1854, a growing Pine River, as it was then known, opened its doors to the world when it cut the channels to Lake Michigan and Lake Charlevoix in 1869. Now, increasingly larger vessels could get into town. Mariners and travelers dazzled by what they saw took away with them their impressions of the natural beauties they discovered, which were spread all over the country. The lodging business had begun two years before that. It wasn't intended for the tourist trade because that hadn't even started yet. It was the outgrowth of a practical, limited need. But once people did begin to discover Pine River Charlevoix and what it had to offer, demand took off to create what was soon to become one of the most renowned resort and tourist destinations of the Midwest, aided by such the items as an 1881 description that said, quote, you lift your eyes and broad Lake Michigan stretches away and from it comes a refreshing breeze, cooling your heated flesh and driving away your headache with a magic akin to a mesmerism, unquote. That's pretty hard to resist, isn't it? They began to arrive by the thousands. Once the largest passenger liners could get in after the channel attained its current width in 1882, the city talk dock at times resembled Grand Central Station. Once the railroad slid into town 10 years later, the floodgates opened and the world streamed into Charlevoix as never before. This Pierre Marquette railroad map shows the importance of Charlevoix up there at top center in slightly larger font size than the surrounding communities and how it was connected to the Midwest. Note the Belvedere Resort is included also just before the name, below the name Charlevoix. In the words of the Pierre Marquette, Charlevoix had become the queen of the Northern Resort country. Even before the deluge of visitors, the question had arisen year after year and would continue to be expressed in our two newspapers for decades. What are we going to do with all these people? Why don't we have more accommodations? Hotel keepers lamented for years about the numbers they had to turn away. In high summer, they still do today. It all began in the mid 1860s when pioneer settler Amos Fox had left with his business partner, Petoskeyite Hiram Rose, built this 900 foot dock into Lake Michigan to service vessels that needed to take on wood fuel for their runs between Chicago and Buffalo. The men had to import a specialized crew to construct the dock. So they put up a small house and barn on River Street, now known as Pine River Lane, about where the Weathervane Terrace Inn lobby is located far off to the left less than a block from the dock construction. It sheltered and fed the crew in the house's west wing of one floor plus loft. Fox and Rose hired Richard Cooper of Little Traverse, now Harvest Springs, to come over and run it. After the dock was completed in 1867, Cooper bought the former boarding house and turned it into a hotel, calling it the Fountain City House. The name came from the passenger vessel Fountain City which had been calling at the dock since 1866. Cooper had become close friends with its captain, James Gibson, who brought him so much of his clientele and who suggested the name. But once the channel was cut in 1869, the little building had more than it could handle. It blossomed until just three years later. Its first section facing the channel stood three stories tall with a capacity for 100 guests 
including a ballroom meeting room on the top floor. It was the largest hotel in Northern Lower Michigan and the terminus of the stagecoaches that ran between here and Petoskey to the east. Within a year, further demand was so great that the ballroom was transformed into eight additional guest rooms. Two more additions followed in 1877 and 1879. This lithograph glamorizes the hotel. It eliminates the channel embankment, making it seem you could walk down to the water and back up with no effort. During the off season, things got a little slow and the hotel became an informal community center. To the right is Charlevoix's first store. In 1878 came our second official hotel, more a boarding house that had a bakery and a grocery store in the front. It was called the Ingleside and became popular with traveling businessmen because it was in the middle of town and they wouldn't have to wait for the bridge openings. Sound familiar? This became the Noble Hotel in the early 1890s, then was severely damaged by fire in 1895. F.N. Chapel bought the structure two years later and transformed the salvageable remnants into a drugstore with offices and rooms to let above before it evolved into the central drugstore, the latest version seen here in 1958. The same year the Ingleside was built, the Belvedere Resort was founded and six cottages went up that summer. A year later, a 16 room boarding house was added for overflow guests and for those established resorters who didn't want to cook on their vacation or who arrived to supervise the construction of their cottages. Increased demand necessitated a dining room meeting room to be added on the south side. This little complex soon turned into a de facto hotel for the resort only. At far right, off in the distance, we see a cupola across the upper channel. The Chicago Club Clubhouse, the first building erected on the new resort in 1881, were about the same purpose. <clears throat> it too quickly became a 27 room hotel for the resort's overflow guests as well as the place where the members ate their meals. The building never did serve the public, but its registration numbers were always included in the Charlevoix Sentinel newspaper tally of hotel guest numbers in the 1880s. This check-in desk is still there. <clears throat> the building has been lovingly maintained as a sterling example of resort stick architecture and remains today as a much used clubhouse but fire codes prevent its upper stories from being used as they were in the past. This is how Bridge Street appeared in 1896, looking north. 15 years prior, in the middle of the East 300 block that is now East Park, blacksmith Robert Miller built the Bridge Street House Hotel. We have no image of it in its first incarnation. The building grew over the years into a very large hotel that stretched from the sidewalk almost to the edge of Round Lake. Note the white building it left on the Mason Street corner. In 1888, this had been converted into the Ferguson House Hotel, where the clothing company is today. So downtown accommodations were popping up. By 1885, the Bridge Street House and the Fountain City House alone, between them, saw 5,960 guests out of a village-wide total of 9,895, an increase of 1,000 from the previous year. Charlevoix was on the move. The Belvedere Clubhouse burned in 1886, and the new Belvedere, now a true public hotel, went up the next year. You can see they retained the old dining room building, the white gable at center as a meeting hall. It was spared from the fire. A few years after the first train arrived in 1892, officials of the Chicago and West Michigan Railway decided to build a hotel of astonishing size at the end of East Dixon on the terrace above the depot to accommodate an always increasing ridership. It was to be called simply the Inn. Calling themselves the Shalovay Improvement Company, they began to build in late summer of 1897. <clears throat> the superstructure went up and by October, the company was urging its workers to hurry. Why, we don't know, because the hotel was never intended to be open over the winter. 
Tons of plaster and lumber went into the top floors before the bottom portion had been stabilized, a very dangerous thing to do. At 3.15 p.m. on October 5th, a 60 mile an hour per wind roared out of the north with no warning, a typical Lake Michigan instant squall. It slammed into the north elevation. The building shuddered and swayed until the north portion collapsed into the center, which pulled the south end down and the whole thing folded in upon itself. Two workmen were thrown off the roof and killed. Two horses were fatally crashed at ground level while their driver was able to jump free. Over 40 workmen were trapped inside, sustaining myriad, some gruesome in injuries, at least one man never able to work again. Those were the days before we went litigation crazy. That's just the way it was. The coroner's inquest absolved the railway of any blame or wrongdoing. All there, there were workers both injured and not who had disagreed vehemently that they had given plenty of fair warning. Those lawsuits that were filed were settled out of court. The wreckage was cleared away within a week and within two months, the inn had been re-erected, readied by a force of at times 100 men for opening on June 25, 1898. The inn, as you can see, was one astounding piece of work. At 250 rooms, it was one of the finest resort hotels in the United States. Second in size in Michigan, only to the Grand on Mackinac Island, which itself took only three months to build. At first, the inn claimed it could sleep 800, but later its brochures paired that back to 500. Who knows the real number? In any case, it was plenty. When you leave the depot area, drive up the hill, turn right on Mercer Boulevard at the top and go to Cherry Street. From the corner, you will have traveled a 10th of a mile. That's how long the building was, 550 feet. If taken to Washington, D.C. and stood on end on the mall, it would have come within five feet of the top of the Washington Monument. The porches stretched a combined total of 1,300 feet, a quarter of a mile. Where exactly was the inn situated? It terminated Dixon Avenue at Mercer, a stretch of land that is now pretty much trees. This is what you would have seen in the beginning, a new rutted dirt Dixon Avenue that was necessary to connect the town with the town, or connect the hotel with the town, sorry. Unfortunately, this extension of Dixon had to slice through the first and ninth fairways of the Chicago Club's 1896 golf course. After the turn of the century, the club moved the course north and reoriented above Elm Street. When you reach the East Dixon stop sign today and turn left, you immediately pass the site of the main entrance, topped by a balcony and two exquisite stained glass windows. When you arrive by train from the south within reservations, if you were on the left side of the car, you would have caught a glimpse of your Charlevoix destination, the stairs behind the depot at center. Where were they exactly? This photo of a brand new depot not yet landscaped in 1892 shows a watering wagon at far right with only trees on the terrace behind it. This is how the area looked six years later with the stairs dominating the view. You walked up them, an impressive welcoming vista, reached the pillar light, turn for a last look at the depot, then behind the bench now in our heritage garden, up you went on a stairway befitting a grand opera to your destination, cross the terrace to walk around its slightly off-center rustic stone fountain until you faced another great set of stairs. It lifted you into the second story east porch. At the top, you paused to look back down the beautiful way you came with a glimpse of the depot's north portico at bottom, then turned again to enter the magnificent main lobby in which no two of its custom-made chairs were alike. The registration desk is off there at far right. The dining room alone could handle 500 at one sitting, served by a crew of 45 black waiters, while afterward you might relax to the sounds of an orchestra there for your listening and dancing pleasure. Outside were tennis courts on which many a prestigious tournament was held and on which 
the great six-year national champion Bill Tilden was said to have played the first American to win at Wimbledon. One of the most remarkable amenities of the inn was the indoor heated swimming pool, or natatorium it was, as it was called. Where was it? When you go down to the depot, it was just off to your right at the bottom of the hill, a few yards from the Lake Charlevoix shore. A handsome, well-proportioned building, functional and plain, that in the beginning sported American flags swagged from the rafters, a slide, diving board, raft, and trapeze over the 105,000 gallon pool. With 60 dressing rooms, it was open to the public for a nominal fee. Look at the reflection of the rafters in the water, like you would be diving into the ceiling. The townspeople loved it at 25 cents. The inn, it goes without saying, was quite the place. This two-page advertising spread pretty well captured the entire panorama of the complex. The natatorium at far left, the train depot, the hotel, and the only image we have of hotel guests promenading. 1898 was a banner year for Charlevoix hotels. In the late 1890s, Robert Elston realized the need of a large hotel in the downtown area. He convinced the city fathers that Newman Street, you can see it at left south of Antrim Street, wasn't all that crucial for east-west traffic. He gained permission to fill in Newman between Bridge and State Streets, and Newman, which is still there beginning at State Street, dwindled into the alley that we have today. On this enlarged land, Elston constructed a 50-plus room hotel in late 1898 <coughs> with a very large lobby open all year around in which everything was up to date in Kansas City. Some Charlevoix residents came here to spend the winters because their homes were difficult to heat if they even had heating. The Elston suffered a terrible 3 a.m. fire in March of 1915, but nobody was hurt because many were awakened by the barking of the resident collie dog that also jumped on the bed of the owner, now Mrs. Cora Biosat, in a frenzied state in time to get everybody out. Everything behind the front facade of the building which somehow remained standing was gutted. The Hotel Elston was rebuilt as the Hotel Michigan and expanded to 92 rooms with the addition of a large extension in the rear seen at lower left. But in November of 1916, it suffered another fire again late at night in 40 mile per hour winds that almost destroyed it again. The fire originated in a second floor linen closet which burned an 11 by two feet hole in the floor to spew sparks and smoke into the lobby and office and then went up through the roof. However, the electricity had been turned off for the season and no fires had been lit for weeks. Mrs. Biosat ridiculously speculated <clears throat> that someone had dropped matches in the linen closet and mice had nibbled on and ignited them or spontaneous combustion had occurred. The Charlevoix Courier reported her as, quote, vigorously probing the matter, unquote. Ha! Huh. Because the following March, the hotel suffered yet another fire, but this time the scoundrels were apprehended. The upshot of a long story is that Cora Biosat twice hired a man named Pearl Johnson for $2,000 to torch the place, once again after the first time didn't succeed. She was overextended in financial hot water and hoped the insurance reimbursement might be applied to her mortgages and two-year interest payment arrears. Both of them ended up in the pokey. The rebuilt building became Hallett's Inn around 1921, then the Hoover Inn in the 1930s, and finally the Lakeview Inn that I remember in 1938. From the front, this building never gave a hint of how large it was. If you stood on the site of Village Graphics back then, this is what you would have seen with the long addition wing out the back. All of this is now, of course, Olson's Plaza since 1963. Also in 1898, portly Dr. L.D. Bartlett here at his residence on Antrim Street, purchased the Bridge Street house and renamed it after himself. The hotel was certainly not as, impress as impressive as the Elston, but a comfortable enough hostelry smack in the middle of downtown. 
The dining room was at the far end overlooking Round Lake, although you couldn't see much of the waterscape. Bartlett catered to families and, as I said back then, hay fever people, as in this 1907 ad. The Hallett family owned at least three hostelries for many years, two identified on this card, the inn which we have seen, the hotel, and the one shown in this brochure after 1901, the Hallett House. Don't you like my wife and I proprietors? Women didn't have names back then. Great shot of the old pedestrian bridge over the Coast Guard Station Skidway on the channel at lower right. The Hallett House and the Hallett Hotel, also open in 1898, stood next to, e next to each other on Belvedere Avenue. Exactly where? See the house at far right? That is the structure that later became the Gray Gables, which itself offered rooms to rent. This Hallett Hotel ledger is from early June 1922, before the summer season went into full swing. Guests had already arrived from St. Louis, Chicago, Cincinnati, Indianapolis, Milwaukee, and Ontario. Another page shows Pasadena, California. And in and this and only one of our smaller hotels, that's from how far away they came to Charlevoix. One year after all the 1898 activity, the seed of the third of the triumvirate of Charlevoix's great hotels was planted. J.S. Baker had a farm implement store on Antrim Street across from the Elston Hotel. He also owned a lot at the far end of West Dixon and announced in March of 1899 that he would be building a small hotel there to be called the Pavilion. Editor of the Charlevoix Sentinel, Willard Smith, said it would enjoy, quote, the most exhilarating breezes in the whole realm of resortdom, unquote. Surprisingly, it was the only hotel constructed here to take advantage of the Lake Michigan panorama. Originally, the renamed Charlevoix Beach Hotel provided a mere 15 rooms over two wings, served by one bath with no office, only a desk in the corner of the dining room. But Baker's wife, Marcia, Martha Elston Baker, daughter of Robert Elston, shown here in her later years at far upper right in front of the Elston House on West Dixon was another story. She initially ran the place with another woman, then took over to become a Charlevoix legend. Martha had inherited her father's genes and then some, a born hotel keeper and razor sharp manager so successful in handling her finances and catering to her clientele that the beach, only five years after opening, came the first expansion upward, which doubled the capacity. Back to the early 1890s, when the coming of the railroad in 1892, with the coming of the railroad in 1892, the Belvedere Hotel began to burst to the seams. So it underwent a few expansions over a decade until it reached this point by 1902, from 40 to well over 80 rooms. This, the 18, sorry, the 1892 modernization included two bathrooms utilized by appointment only. Otherwise, you clean yourself up in the waters of an often frigid Lake Charlevoix. The hotel reached its final stage in 1923, offering many more private bathrooms along the way with the addition of a new solarium at Wright in that year. So she became what I call the grand, rather stern dowager of the three big resort hotels. It's difficult today to drive to the end of Belvedere Avenue and visualize a building of that size on the lawn. I was in it a few times and could never understand what all the excitement was about. There was little that was stylish about the place, especially the exposed water pipes. I told my father it looked like a carpeted furniture warehouse. The Belvedere was pretty bare bones. To the left of the stairway against the rear wall appears a plain rod with twisted coat hangers on it. Not too classy. To me, the Belvedere was old fashioned and musty, at least in the 1950s when I saw it. At that time, you could sink into a couch and be surrounded by a faint cloud of dust. You might enjoy a nice pot of tea in the tea room or attend a function in the austere ballroom, which showed nothing to attract the eye. 
Even the dining room had a clinical aspect to it, as in this exaggerated drawing that shows it to be much more spacious than it actually was. After you entered with high expectations, the ceiling literally descended several feet around the pillars. <clears throat> From the perspective of our allegedly more enlightened, or as they now say, woke times, the Belvedere Hotel had an edge to it that was not pleasant to contemplate. Look at the wording on the left, small print, fifth line down. Polite and attentive, white servants. That speaks for itself, quite unlike the inn which had black employees from the start. Then go over to the right, second line down. At the Belvedere, it gets even worse. No objectionable patronage of any class or character. That is not so subtle code if you knew how to read it. Focus on the word objectionable. Again, you are reassured this time in so many syllables that do not say what they mean, you were expected to comprehend. In other words, no Jews allowed. Am I being harsh? Reading something into these words that might not be there and mean just objectionable characters in general? How do you judge if you've never met them? No, I'm not being harsh at all. The Belvedere Hotel was openly anti-Semitic, an anomaly in a town that unlike many resorts in Michigan, cordially welcomed as did the Inn and the Beach its Jewish clientele. It was published unashamedly. If your name even sounded remotely Jewish, forget it. You'd be turned down on the spot. This brochure page, bottom line, assured you that the hotel was operated for Gentiles only. When it came time to revise the brochure, the message could not have been made even more explicit, now exclusively Gentile. Another brochure claimed that the hotel, hotel catered to a, quote, discriminating clientele, unquote. As far as that phrasing goes, they weren't just whistling Dixie. By 1908, Mr. Bartlett, Dr. Bartlett felt the need for a change. In January 1909, he sold his hotel to John and Martha Baker, who now had a downtown branch for the Beach Hotel, which was always filled. They renamed it Baker's Inn and ran it for several years. Dr. Bartlett, in the meantime, in June of 1909, opened another Bartlett Hotel on Park Avenue in the large Faulkner House located directly across from today's Congregational Church Community Hall. Baker's Inn eventually became the Hotel Charlevoix under dental surgeon John Auld. Upon Auld's retirement, the building was sold to dentist C.J. Winder and his wife. What was it with these medical men who wanted to own and run hotels? Back to the beach. The 1904 building lasted eight years until a 1912 expansion, but even that was not enough, so an entire remodeling was rescheduled after the 1914 season. A Chicago architect drew up plans for a 63-foot by 63-foot addition that would take the beach further west. Work progressed over the winter, and a brand new wing appeared, seven stories up from the shore the tallest building ever constructed in Charlevoix. <clears throat> Over on the right is the covered beach pavilion, whose foundation walls can still be seen sticking out of the sand. The number of rooms increased from around 100 to close to 200 with 86 baths. Now we have a third of our resort hotels after the dowdy, snooty Belvedere and the elegant inn, which both face serious competition. <coughs> The beach was one class act, not overpowering as the inn could be. The Charlevoix Courier called it a paradise, a new and beautiful haven of splendor, a triumph of beauty and an honor to the city. From the moment you ascended its short welcoming stairs and entered its warm lobby full of wood and stone with Mrs. Baker's portrait in oil over the fireplace, a glimpse of the sun parlor overlooking Lake Michigan, the ballroom, also known as the casino, adjacent to the tea room, each 60 by 60 feet. I'm sorry, 60 by 30 feet. One summer, you could have gathered here to enjoy the music, 
of Mr. Rack and his celebrated Tangerine Grove Orchestra with Miss Wong, a very celebrated novelty pianist in Chinese costume. The tastefully appointed 11, 112 by 32 foot dining room could seat 350 to 400 plus a private banquet room. You were dazzled by what you found. All this told you that the beach was a place into which a lot of thought had been invested and had put the Belvedere to shame. 1915 saw the first hotel elevator in Charlevoix, an elegant bronze affair, and the beach also enjoyed its own ticker tape connection to the Chicago Stock Exchange. <clears throat> the bedrooms were done in the style of the times, bright and airy, each with running water, if not a full bath. The beach, like the inn, had its own tennis court for a while, seen at bottom behind the turreted house on Pine River Lane. Until the pressure of increased demand caused an annex to go up in its place that housed both guests and the staff dormitory. The annex stood at the edge of the bluff for many years until it was raised and the section moved over to Lewis Street where it stands at number three or 208. Not only did she have these two buildings, but an astute Martha Baker began to buy up neighborhood Victorian houses she dubbed cottages at their peak numbering 14, they gave her an extra 100 rooms. Here in quick succession are 11 of them. Thanks to the donation to us of artifacts from the Earl Young Estate, we now have a map that identifies each one and its location. The last one that you just saw, the Baker Cottage at bottom, <clears throat> is now the Bridge Street Inn B&B on the highway corner at Wexdeskum. Its wraparound porch was used in a brochure. Each cottage was furnished to the nines, most of them spacious and some capable of holding several families at once. It was estimated that at its peak, if every sleeping service in the Beach Hotel complex was utilized, Martha Baker had the capability of housing around 1,000 people per night. Portions of the beach stayed open way longer than the Inn or Belvedere, and like the Fountain City House of Old, it too became somewhat of a community center. This invitation was extended for a Wild West party in late November of 1906. It was mailed to 17-year-old Irene Harsha, who would marry our famous builder in stone Earl Young nine years later. And look how the penny postcard was addressed. That's how the mail could be delivered in those days. The post office knew where you lived. Four years after the beach expansion, a young man, <clears throat> a young ophthalmology student at the University of Chicago, who had a sideline as a musician's representative, got in touch with Martha Baker. He offered to supply a six-man orchestra for a nine-week season. After much tough negotiation on both sides, he did just that in 1919 and 1920. Four years after that, Jules Stein took his newfound exper expertise in handling musicians, which he partially gained at the beach in Charlevoix, and founded what would become MCA, the Music Corporation of America, the giant showbiz conglomerate that went on to re represent almost the entire gamut of the entertainment industry. <clears throat> A quick look at a few of the other significant hotels that served the Charlevoix tourist and resort industry. In the early 1920s, the old Lewis Grand Opera House, built 1883, was transformed into the Hotel Alhambra beside the Channel Bridge. It was named after the famed reddish brick Moorish Castle in Granada, Spain, because of its new red facade brickwork. Galleries were added on two sides for fire safety, and this is what you would have seen from the Weather Main restaurant area. Around the same time, prominent businessman Harry Oldham, who lived at 209 Park Avenue, shown here, constructed an exclusive guest house fine dining establishment on the hill at the rear of his property next to the water tower. <clears throat> it will also offer unpublicized gambling during the Roaring Twenties in an era when gambling was illegal but ignored in Charlevoix because of the high rollers who came here. 
The Oldham Club had 11 bedrooms and a balcony for an excellent view over Lake Michigan. The rustic bridge over the driveway next to the Hotel Bartlett property served two purposes. Oldham guests could cross over to picnic and enjoy the panorama from the Bartlett's Channel Side Hill, and Bartlett guests could cross over to gamble without being seen from the street. In the 30s, the two hotels merged with the new ownership name change, but not for long, and the rechristened tower spun off on its own for another 20 or so years. This is now, of course, the Sandcastle Condominium. Sadly, it was around this time that our initial hotels started to fade from the scene. The first to go out in a spectacular way was the Hotel Bartlett Baker Charlevoix, which burned beyond repair on June 5, I'm sorry, June 7, 1935. Some of the oldest buildings in Charlevoix were gone by that time from the gap to the left of the burning building. But the view through the new gap and larger gap sparked an idea. What with the Great Depression ha <clears throat> having allowed the Round Lake waterfront to deteriorate at an alarming rate, a great plan was formed. This is the mess that the city dock had turned into, certainly not up to the standards of our claim of being Charlevoix the Beautiful. The Mason Street dock was hardly better. Why not get rid of them and replace them with a park that ideally would stretch over three blocks all the way from the Channel Bridge to Antrim Street? A group of determined businessmen and city fathers went to work and partially succeeded. They were able to buy all but the two corner properties of the East 300 block of Bridge Street, but that was it, and proved to be enough. By 1937, thanks to the destruction of an old hotel, we received this, and you all know what that means for Charlevoix. Next, it was the turn of the inn, a fate that was never expected to happen. But the effects of the Great Depression and reduced rail ridership because of the continued rise of the automobile sealed its fate after 43 seasons. Plus, it had no room for parking in a large number of cars. As far back as 1922, the hotel had built this 50-car garage on Cherry Street near the site of the Community Reformed Church. Hardly enough for what was really needed. <clears throat> The humidity damaged swimming pool building had been sold at the Chicago Club Resort and was torn down in 1926. By the end of the 1930s, the handwriting was on the wall and it would have been foolish to even try to continue. 1940 was the last year of operation. Then on September 17, 1941, came the great auction of contents gathered in the lobby where so much elegance had once been on daily parade. These four columns are now in the downstairs living room of my house. My father got them for his photographic studio, plus a section of the frieze, two of the diamond leaded windows, and many of the upper balusters for $64. Afterwards, in one of the saddest weeks Charlevoix ever experienced, in his words, off came the siding to expose the tar paper with the stained glass window still intact. The south end was attacked, followed by the north end, that followed by the east facade, and bricks cascaded down the fireplace chimney, while tens of thousands of feet of lumber piled up in the yard like an infinite game of jack straws, until only the foundations remained in the memory of so much of what once was. <clears throat> in August of 1942, Charlevoix was thrilled when the Detroit Lions came to town for a summer football practice. They stayed at the Bartlett Hotel on Park Avenue, arriving just in time to help Nellie Bartlett celebrate her 80th birthday. The men even bought her this dress for the occasion in which she would later be buried. It must have been quite a party. The Lions went on to have the worst season in their history until the windless debacle of 2008. In 1947, it was the turn of the almost derelict Alhambra. Its demise was hastened by the construction of the current bridge. Only a sloping lawn remains in the hotel's footprint. <clears throat> in the late 1940s, the former summer home of auto magnate Ransom E. Olds, founder of Oldsmobile, came into the hands of Mr. and Mrs. William Butters, who remodeled it into the Butters Sunset Lodge. Where was it located? 
On Michigan Avenue, a stone's throw from the beach, seen it right. Each room had its own plate glass window and the Butters lived in an on-premises apartment. The next demise was the Fountain City House. The building had been vacant for only the last two of its 90 years. It came down in 1955 and the lot sat empty for six more years until Earl Young began to build the Weathervane Terrace on the site. Then in 1956 came one of the most incredible events in Charlevoix's history. On October 6, when the hotel was closed for the season and the butters were out for dinner, a fire broke out on the lower level. <clears throat> the wind was howling off Lake Michigan at a steady 40 miles per hour with gusts up to 55. By the time the fire department arrived, the heat had cracked several west and north windows, which blew out onto the lawn and the wind roared in inside like a giant bellows. The building almost exploded. Flames were soon towering 100 feet into the sky. Embers were later found floating in Lake Charlevoix. Gradually, the lodge began to disappear into the inferno, which became so incandescent <clears throat> It melted a steel safe that contained the butter's most personal items, including memorabilia of their only son, who had been severely injured in World War II and died a few years after the war ended. When it was over, only a few bathtubs were recognizable and some twisted lawn furniture. The insurance hardly touched the $95,000 loss, over $900,000 today, the Butters lost almost all of their personal possessions and did not rebuild. Three years later, a new kid on the block appeared when a badly needed weather vane lodge opened down the highway from the Butters catastrophe. Today, of course, the Hotel Earl. <clears throat> now it was time for the Belvedere Hotel to be given the gimlet eye. The aging dowager had seen less and less patronage after World War II when travel patterns change, depending largely on its mainstay of conventions. It gradually cut down to a maximum capacity of 47 guests and less than half the rooms. After a, de a decade of discussion, around 1959, a study showed that to redecorate and bring it up to code, the resort association faced a $100,000 investment for a very uncertain future and decided against the risk. 1960 would have to be the last season. The porch rockers, symbol of decades of summertime living that had witnessed so much genteel resort life were replaced by bathtubs put out for auction after Labor Day. This is the Detroit Free Press's take on what was happening. They not only are tearing down a hotel at Charlevoix, they are rooting out the last vestiges of what once was a way of life in this land when we lived in the age of innocence. The wreckers went to work on November 3rd until only the elevator shaft was left standing. Who had patronized, ate in, or just stepped inside the Belvedere for a glance that we know of? Michigan poet laureate Edgar Guest, who gave us the immortal line, it takes a heap of living and a house to make it home. Beloved American author Booth Tarkington from 1900 to 1922. Barry Goldwater before he became a senator. Bruner Bing Crosby. Automotive Titan Ransomy Olds on the right, who spent his last summer on the resort. Illinois governor and presidential election loser twice to Dwight Eisenhower, Adlai Stevenson. Popular film star of the 20s and 30s, Constance Bennett who once got top billing over to Cary Grant. Dean Acheson, President Truman's Secretary of State and International Statesman. Creator of Tarzan, Edgar Rice Burroughs and the untouchable himself, Elliot Ness. Next to go was the Bartlett over the winter of 1966-67. It and the Bedford house next to my house at Rice were moved to make way for what later became the Captain's Watch condos. Now for the grand finale, for which we return to the early 20s. Martha Baker had great plans for the beach after World War I. I think her ambition was to surpass the inn. Over 130 more rooms were planned, each with a bath, a pipe organ in the casino, 
Dining capacity increased to 700, but Mrs. Baker died in Miami in 1922, <clears throat> leaving her fortune around half a million dollars, plans, properties, and outstanding mortgages to her daughter, who inherited not a whit of her mother's business and hospitality genes. To her husband, she left the hotel laundry, go figure. The daughter was a flighty party girl married to a high living gambler, gambler with shady connections. The beach's guests were to them a little more than an open wallet. Slowly, the beach began its decline. One by one, the cottages had to be sold to meet obligations. The couple tried to maintain appearances, but the depression took its toll along with their mismanagement. In 1938, the beach was hit by three chimney roof fires that caused extensive damage. Note the last paragraph, no insurance. They couldn't even afford that. Another fire the following year severely damaged the kitchen and caused the whole kitchen wing to sag. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. The beach went into receivership and the owner slunk out of town under a cloud of a terrible reputation for incompetence and deceit. A series of well-meaning later owners did their best, rebuilding and redecorating in places such as this 1950s nautical-themed bar and game room. The lobby was still its warm, welcoming self. It looked like after World War II that the building might have a chance, but it was not to be. Conventions like at the Belvedere helped. A try at the ski business couldn't make it because of the enormous expense of heating. And here you see the name has been changed to the Holiday Terrace Hotel in the 1960s. At the very end, the hotel totally lost what little class it had left. A man named Harry Hogan, big on Charlevoix real estate, wanted to bring in go-go girls to his basement bar called the Hare's Lair. The name undoubtedly influenced by Hugh Hefner's Playboy Bunnies and the Playboy Clubs. But the Charlevoix Ministerial Association intervened by claiming that this entertainment would undermine public morality, lead to illicit sex, and was apt to lead astray servicemen stationed at Charlevoix. Note the last sentence at bottom right. Hogan also planned to tear down the beach and rebuild with what was actually a 12-story circular structure, including eight floors of wedge-shaped rooms that had a revolving cocktail lounge and dining room at the top. It actually reached the drawing board, then an alternate eight-story cylinder with six floors of rooms redesigned by local architect Jack B. Grow was tried, but neither version was ever, was ever built. <clears throat> So an abandoned, once elegant beach fell apart. Kids threw stones through the windows. You can see broken panes. And those that they couldn't reach, they peppered with slingshots and pellet guns. One of the staircases at right, you can see, is missing. West windows disappeared, which allowed wind and weather to penetrate deep into the interior, which also suffered from vandalism. And one of the porch pillars toppled to block the sidewalk. The neighbors rightfully feared a major fire like that which had decimated the Sunset Lodge next door and voiced their concerns. There was no alternative. The beach had to go. <clears throat> the entryway that had welcomed so many tens of thousands was littered with demolition. And the end was nigh. But the beach didn't go out as planned. She made one last defiant gesture. Just after this photo was taken on the morning of October 16, 1967, a spark from a workman's torch hit some debris and up she went. All that day and night and well into the next day, flames and smoke towered into the sky, not driven by the winds that had threatened the north side with a conflagration 11 years before, yet a spectacular sight nonetheless. No attempt was made to extinguish such a large expanse, only keep it under control. By the second night, all that remained were piles of wet, stinking ash, smoldering timbers, and broken foundation walls. So it ended. From the time Richard Cooper opened the Fountain City House in 1867 to the wretched demise of the beach, 100 years of Charlevoix's hotel industry had passed. A glorious era that had experienced so much had come to an inglorious end the likes of which will never be seen here again. It had been a century filled with luxury, glamour, scandal, 
the flaunting of unimaginable wealth, a constant round of dances and teas, wide open gambling, parties wild and subdued, drama, for Charlevoix Ice, an annual eye-opening exposure to another way of life, an era that took Charlevoix's name around the world. Unbelievable as it may sound, our visitors didn't just come here by the hundreds of thousands. A little math reveals that Charlevoix has been experienced in one way or another by millions. One final thought, how big was our hotel industry at its peak? Consider this, according to the Charlevoix Chamber of Commerce, the town today has around 370 rooms of all sorts available. The inn alone at bottom left offered 250 rooms all by itself for over 40 years. For those of you who want to learn more, this 32 page booklet on the entirety of Charlevoix's hotel industry is available at the museum at Harsha House store or from our website. Thank you all again for being here this evening. Your final exam will be in two weeks. Bring a blue book and a number two pencil. Now we can unmute and we'll get back face to face for any questions you might have. Thank you, Dave.